All right, guys, in this video, what we're going to talk about is the historical method. What is the historical method? Well, it's like the scientific method, but for historians. Historians do quite a bit of arguing about what is the correct historical method, but for the most part, they're kind of on the same page in general. You know, I'm not going to get into like their debates about precise things. But the historical method, like the scientific method, is not really one single method. It's actually sort of a family of methodologies. And there's room for argument in history a lot of times because you'll see why that is. There's sort of evidence on one side of an issue and on another side, and you argue about which, which evidence is stronger, you know, and carries the day. Um, and so let's just get right into it. How does the historical method work? Well, there's three basic things that we need to talk about before we get into what are called historical criteria, which are sort of the little methods by which they make a case that essentially the question is, how do we know something happened in the past? You know, like somebody wrote, you know, like, or really, how do we have any idea at all? Well, our best source of information are what's called uh, documents, written documents. So, unless you think that, like, a troop of baboons got loose in ancient Rome or ancient Babylon with some pen and paper and, and wrote, you know, these ancient historical documents that we have, then, you know, duh, it, they were written by people. So, the Greeks put it this way. They said, writing is the mother of memory. When something is written down, you can, like, go back to it and find out what somebody thought back when that thing was written. But the question that arises for us is like, okay, you have an ancient document that was written at some point in the past. How do you know it's really ancient, you know? Well, one of the first things you're looking for is like, the printing press is a machine that allows us to make lots and lots of copies of things. And it was invented basically at the end of the Middle Ages in the 1400s. Okay, before that you have what's called manuscripts manual as in manual labor and script as in written so like literally it means handwritten now these manuscripts there are modern forgeries where people will totally make up like pretend to write they will write a book that's supposedly like like a book of the bible or something like oh peter wrote this book and i'm you know they forge it as though they're peter and they make a fake ancient manuscript in modern times. That is totally a thing that happens. And so we have to have a way of figuring out how old the manuscript is. And also, the, the date of the manuscript is going to become super important for other reasons. It's just dating the manuscript is vital. And it becomes vital for like dating when the, the original was made. Because... The natural assumption is if you find a, an ancient manuscript, it's probably not the original. Like if you were to go outside, like I remember one time I was uh, doing some demolition on like, like taking an old room that had been added onto an even older house and I was taking the room down and I found an old scrap of newspaper that appeared to be from the 1950s, um, literally under the house that had been preserved, just down there under the house in the crawl space. A scrap of newspaper and had all these like 1950s uh uh like uh it was like a sears thing and they wanted to sell you 1950s furniture for your kitchen and it was just like zing wow exciting you know like it was like well, look at all this 50s stuff um the thing about it was uh i can safely say that it's very likely that that's not the original copy of that sales paper from sears from back then it's probably a copy because more copies were made than originals. There's one original and there's copies. So if you find an ancient manuscript, the natural assumption is that the original or what's called the autograph, which just means that like the guy that wrote it, wrote it like, like the original guy, you know, self-written. Um, and oftentimes it's written by like a team of people in the ancient world because most people didn't know how to read or write. And you would hire a guy who knew how to read and write, and it would be your job. You'd be called a scribe, and you would just write stuff. Because they had no machines to write anything, much less computer screens. Everything was literally written by hand. Okay, um, 
So how do we date the manuscript, and then how do we arrive at like a further date for when the original autograph was made? So there's two ways. The way the manuscript's dated is they do something called radiocarbon dating because it's always made from some plant or some animal. Sometimes they're made from animal hides, sometimes they're made from plants. But when that creature died, it stopped taking in carbon-14 from the air, and the carbon-14 that was present in it decayed into, I think, carbon-13, I can't remember. Uh, and it decays at this very steady rate where like a certain amount of time goes by and half of it's gone, and then you have half of that, and then you have half of that. And so you can measure that and come up with a date on, a, on an ancient document, they might say, give or take 60 years. So that gives you an idea. But one question that arises is like, okay, but how do we prove that the carbon dating is reliable? How do we know that over the court, you know, some of these documents, some of these manuscripts that we have, like, I think the oldest manuscript we have of the Bible dates to like, they're guessing 110 to 170 AD, you know, maybe like 90, you know, um, but like, the, we're talking about the physical document. Okay, I think they give it like 110 to 170. Maybe it's 100 to 170, I think, is it? We're talking about the manuscript, not the, you know, this is a this is a fragment of John, and we know it comes from John because, like, you take a scrap, even if it's credit card size, and lay it down on the page, and all the words and letters line up, then you know that's from that, you know. Um, but, like, how do, you, how do you date that manuscript? Well, they do the carbon dating, but how do you know that you can trust carbon dating? How do you know that radioactive decay has not sped up or slowed down over time? What if it's actually much older or much younger? Like, how, how do we know that we can rely on it? Well, the way that they do that is they have another dating method called paleography. And what paleography is, is means like paleo, ancient, graphos, writing. So like ancient writing. They study writing styles. And, and, it, uh, and you can date something. So like, for example, all of us tend to be familiar with the King James Bible. And the King James Bible uh, comes from a very specific period. Basically, it's written in what's called 16th century English, which is confusing, but that means it comes from the 1500s, from the days of Queen Elizabeth and, and also her successor, King James, and like uh, the days of Shakespeare, you know, Francis Bacon, and Sir Francis Drake, and you know, the Spanish Armada. English just had a certain way it sounded, the way, a certain way people spoke English back then that is weird for us today. And you can identify that, you can come up with a date based on that. Um, uh, also the way they write words. So I'll give you two examples from the King James. Um, uh, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, uh, he tells him to remove the stone, and he, he, Lazarus' sister Martha says, Lord, surely by this time he stinketh. Or I think she says, sure, she says, by this time he stinketh. Okay, we would never word it that way today. We would never say that, you know, first of all, we wouldn't say stinketh. But also, we wouldn't say, Lord, by this time he stinks. You know, that's kind of odd, you, you know, it's kind of crude, you know. But English, older English had a lot of short, sharp words like that that we, we tend to draw it out more today. Um, so like today, like in the NIV, they, they translate it in a different way because the original is not in English. The original is in ancient Greek. Um, remember the text of John that we had, you know, 110 to 170 AD, okay? Um, and she she's translated this way, Martha says, Lord, by this time there is an odor. There, there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And it's just a sort of a different way, instead of saying, surely he stinketh. You know? um, another example about this, too, is like the way letters and words are formed. Um, if, you've, if you've ever gotten like a really old book from the library, you bought a really old book, there, there's a few little things in there that like look a little odd about how they printed the letters. Um, but the King James has a great example of this in Genesis 1.1. They've changed the King James quite a bit over the years. If you go buy a King James Bible, I'm not talking about a new King James. I'm talking about if you go buy like an original King James, 
it's not really an original King James. They just kept changing it and just kind of didn't talk about it. But they have the original one still there in England. It's only from 1611, so that's 400 years ago. Um, so, like, and so, I mean, that's way later than, you know, 110 to 170, which is, you know, our main script of John, you know, um, which goes back to, like, you know, the days of Jesus, right? But uh, the, uh, it says in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And this is how they spell darkness. And you can see they've got scans online. You can double check what I'm saying. D-A-R-K-N-E-F-F-E. -E. Darkness. And that, that 400 years ago, that's how they did that. Okay? That was just normal English. So, like, if you understand how that works, you realize, like, yeah, you could come up with sort of a date range based on paleography, on ancient writing. All right? Like modern Greek is different from uh, Koine Greek, which is the Greek of the of the Bible. But then there's earlier forms of Greek, you know, ancient Greek and that kind of thing. Um, anyway, the thing is, paleography is radically different from radiocarbon dating. And if the paleography and the radiocarbon dating give you independently arrive at the same date, then you know you've got reliable dating methods because they wouldn't, you know, and they repeatedly do that, you know you've got something here, okay, that, that's, that's trustworthy. Most of the time, they, they just use paleography, and they only do carbon dating basically enough to confirm that they know what they're talking about with paleography to confirm the whole, because carbon dating is a destructive test, so you have to cut a piece of the, of the document off and, and uh, destroy it to do the test. Okay, now, the question becomes like, okay, well, when was the autograph written because it's older? All right, well, one way that they do that is, you know, if, you know, for example, um, if you have some text that quotes from, the, from another text, then you know that, that, you know, the thing that was quoted was already in existence. And if you can establish in some sort of known way a date for one of the texts, then that allows you to establish a date for the other text. Okay. And another thing that you can do is like, sometimes they talk about events in history and it, it's obvious that, like, I, I, I give you an example. Um, Aldous Hux, Huxley wrote Ends and Means before World War II happened. And he's just going on and on and on in there about he's worried about the Nazi threat that's arising in, uh, in Germany. And he, he really tries to argue that like you people out there, y'all should be scared of, of Hitler and the Nazis. Y'all aren't taking them seriously enough. Okay. But like after war two, like nobody would say that, <laughs> right? Because, uh, you know, um, I mean, when we call somebody a Nazi today, it's just sort of common knowledge that, that means bad. I mean, they, it's just Nazis today have just become synonymous with evil. But it wasn't that way before, you know, World War II. Before World War II, you know, people didn't know about the concentration camps. That was discovered as Germany fell. Um, so, like, this fear that he has... It really dates this text. You can tell a lot about when it was written. Um, he talks about events that occurred. Um, he, you know, major events that don't get mentioned and major events that do get mentioned let you know the time window, like when he existed. Or if, like, a, if a text that we, or sometimes we have a text that we know a date for based on methods that I just talked about and it quotes another text, then we know that that other text is older. And then the reverse is true, like, if, like, say, a text quotes some other text, then we know that it came after it, and if the one, if the earlier one, like, has a known date, then we, we can ascribe a date, and we can kind of sandwich it, in, we can sandwich a text in between two, and we can say, well, it would, the original would have been written at this time. 
Okay. Um, they go into greater detail on some of this stuff, and like, and get historians really argue about this whole dating thing because it's like super important. Um, but an example of like a serious argument is like there's this uh, sayings gospel that's attributed to Thomas, and it's just a list of things that Jesus said. Okay, it's not in the Bible, but it's like the the oldest manuscript comes from like 200 A.D. Okay, that's not all that out of range. Like a lot of our oldest manuscripts, our oldest oldest fragments that we have for like Mark and and John and that come from between one and 200 A.D. Okay, so 1900 to 1800 years ago, uh, but like. The question is, well, how far back do you push the original? And so that sometimes they do what's called like textual criticism, and so it gets into this question of like, okay, this is how it works. They're pretty sure Mark was written first, all right, before uh, Luke and John, or Matthew, Luke, and John. They say they think Mark was written first. Okay, then came Luke and John. Don't know which was next, and then came John, last. Okay. So Mark is generally no, you know, some people argue a little bit about the date, but basically 70 A.D. is like an uncontroversial date, and then 90 to 110 A.D. for John, somewhere in there. Um, but th they argue, you know, about this stuff. But like, some people want to push John before 70. It generally doesn't get pushed past 70, from what I've seen. I mean Mark, um, but like. It's clear that Matthew and Luke just straight borrow things from Mark, that they were aware of Mark because they were things almost exactly the same as Mark. You're not going to do that by accident. So they had access to Mark. Or maybe Mark, there was some other gospel that, they, that all three of them had access to. But the most reasonable explanation is they had access to Mark. All right, and then there's stuff that's in Luke, like, you know, Mary talking to the angel, saying this, you know, he tells her he's going to be born of a virgin. There's stuff that's only in Matthew, like um, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, is really only in Matthew. There's a, a Sermon on the Plain in Luke that's super similar, but it's not the same. Or like uh, Matthew has this whole story about the guards at the tomb, of Jesus' tomb, and how they report back that the disciples stole the body and all that. That's only in Matthew. Okay, um, the, uh, so we could say that, like, while Matthew and Luke borrow from Mark and rely on Mark, they also are, some, they also are like, a separate source of information. But there's also this, like, there's some stuff that Matthew and Luke have in common. Okay, and this gets into, like, a question of, like, okay, did they have another source that they both used for this stuff that they have in common that's not in Mark? Or did they, uh, or did like Luke borrow that stuff from Matthew and it's all come from Matthew or the reverse? Well, this hypothetical document has been labeled the Q document. And there's this question of Q. Q would be older, you know, and it would be like maybe as old as Mark. Okay? And what's in Q? Well, what is in Q actually is super similar to what's in this sayings gospel of Thomas. So then you have you can make this case that like, and some people make this case that like, the Saints Gospel of Thomas therefore uh, should be dated all the way back with Mark. It's that old, and it all depends on whether or not Q existed. Okay, now a counter argument has been made that there's this other text called the Diatessaron, which is a second century text, which means it's like was written after 100 A.D., and it seems that the Gospel of Thomas is more similar to the Diatessaron than Q, and so you make that case, and it's like, okay, you can't really make a case on Q, and Q is hypothetical anyway. Um, but anyway, that's sort of just an example of how these debates go. I'm just trying to give you a feel for it. Okay, um, the next thing we need to talk about is something called point of view. As the historian N.T. Wright puts it, the thing we're most certain about in history is the point of view of the author. And the, the philosophical justification is just that, like, 
when somebody writes something, uh, tells a story, they have to pick things to put in the story and have to pick things to leave out of the story. And whatever you do there has to be informed by your real point of view. And you may wonder, okay, well, we, we know what the point of view of the author was. Why is that such a big deal? It'll be a big deal later on 